how to commune one of the last fellowship mission. This morning we are continuing with the World Congress. The World Congress is a session of hearing the word and be transformed by the word as we believe God's word. Hallelujah. And so we continue with the World Congress where we come that we may hear God's word and be healed of our infirmities across us. As we participate this morning, God will perfect all that concerns you. Amen. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this morning as we come to listen and to hear and to receive your word. We ask that every heart be blessed this morning by the entrance of your word, giving life and understanding to each one in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right, in the next few minutes, we'll be dealing with the living faith. The living faith. Hallelujah. Now, when we come to faith, faith has to do with trust and confidence in someone. Let's read the book of Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. In Galatians 2, 20, the Bible says, Paul writing, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Hosea chapter 12 verse 13 says, And by a prophet the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, and by a prophet he preserved them. By a prophet, he brought them out of Egypt, and by a prophet, he preserved them. Now, let me start again by saying that faith is the confidence or confident assurance that one has with regards to what he hopes for. When you are very sure of what you are looking forward to, when you are very confident of something, even though you have not seen the reality, the physicality of that thing, you are very confident. You have considered it done. Even though it is not physically done, then you are operating in faith. Now, the reality of such faith or that confident assurance you are having is dependent on the one on whom that faith is relied on. So if I am trusting a friend, that this friend will do what I've asked him to do, that is faith in my friend. But if that faith will produce anything or not, depends on the character and the personality of my friend. If my friend is not faithful, then my faith will be frustrated. I will lose everything because that my friend cannot be trusted. When there is an exam or okay, an election, we are going out there to vote for someone who have promised this and promised that. And we feel, we feel confident that when this person becomes the president, he will fulfill all that we are trusting him to fulfill. That is why it is called faithfulness. We are trusting him to fulfill what we have fated on him. All right? Now, if he is not someone who stands by his word, he might go there and we'll get disappointed, just like we get disappointed every year in Africa. Whenever we finish our election, we elect somebody. We are trusting that things will be better with this person, but at the end of the day, it turns out to be worse than we expect. Meaning that that faith we placed on that person was not productive. There is no work from him to back up the faith we have with, on him. Faith without work is dead. Now we have the faith on him, but he is to do the work to make that faith a reality, but he didn't do that work. And so our faith becomes dead. All right. So the same thing. If we have faith in God, we have confidence in God based on his promises, based on his work. It now behoves God to work. In other words, to do his own part. Our own part is to trust him and his own part is to perfect what we have trusted him according to his promise. All right. 
when we say by a prophet, the Israel was brought out of Egypt, and by a prophet, they were preserved. We are not talking about a human being being a prophet, you know, somebody who is your prophet that will come and bring you out of your Egypt, as it were, and bring you and preserve you. Some people have declared themselves such kind of prophet, and they will say, my prophet, my helper, my prophet, my helper. A prophet, a human being prophet, is not your helper. The word prophet here talks about the declaration of the word of God. The declaration of the word of God. And so it can be put this way, by the word of God, by the word of God, Israel was brought out of Egypt. And by the word of God, they were preserved. That was why it was told, the man shall not live by bread alone, but by the word that comes from the mouth of God. The same way for us, by the faith we have in God's word, we were delivered from the bondage of sin and death. And by the same faith we have in God, we will be preserved unto the coming of the Lord. That is why Paul says, I pray that your spirit, soul, and body be preserved unto the coming of the Lord. So your faith, the first faith you had was the saving faith. You believed and you were saved. The Bible says, for by grace are we saved through faith. It's not of our own works. It is of faith. So that no one word will boast. The gift of God is eternal life. God provides and says, I'm going to give you eternal life. And you believed. And when you believed, eternal life was given to you. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 1. It says, having believed the gospel of your salvation, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So Jesus promised the Holy Spirit to be the stamp of ownership on anyone who believes in him. Now your own duty is to respond to his word and you believe that gospel, that good news, that word of God. And by believing, you were sealed with that promised Holy Spirit. Now, in line with our teaching this morning, we are looking at the living faith, not the saving faith. We are assuming that you have been saved but how do I live the rest of my life? The Bible tells us that the just shall live by faith. In other words, the one who have believed in God, the one who have been saved, shall live the rest of his life continuously believing in the same person who brought him out of darkness into his marvelous light. So our confidence is not in man. Our confidence is in God. We are saved by the grace of God. But that grace of God is still sufficient and able to meet our needs. The Bible says, he makes all grace abound unto you, so that in all situations, you'll be able to meet your needs. Now, God has made promises. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, which is being born again, and other things shall be added unto you. He said, those who do not know God, they run after all these things because they do not have confidence in God. They believe in themselves, they believe in their own ability, and they work hard and hard and pursue it 24 hours a day to meet up their needs. But God is saying, seek ye first the kingdom of God. In other words, until you are born again and by faith, which is an his righteousness, then all these other things through the same faith shall be added unto you. Now we are in a world where many Christians will say, nothing has been added unto me. I have asked, God promised me this, God promised me that, but he did not happen. Now we're going to examine those promises you claim God has promised you. Anything God promises, God fulfills. When he gives his word, he stands by his word. And so if he does not promise and you are holding on to what he has not promised, and then you count him unfaithful to that, then you are not being fair to yourself and to God. So the living faith is the faith you live by. You are now a child of God. You are born again. You have to live by faith. Because we are not just physical beings. Everybody lives by faith anyway. But Paul writing here says, I have been crucified with Christ. In other words, by my union with Christ, I have been saved. 
I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. In other words, I am still physically available. I have been a new creature. I am born again. I am still physically available, just like as if nothing has happened. But the life I now live, I do not live in the flesh. I live by the confidence I have from Jesus Christ. He said, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So am I living my life now by the faith of the Son of God or by the faith of my own personal ideology and hard work or my own personal philosophy? Yes, your, your personal philosophy and ideology can take you to some extent, but you see yourself trying to meet up to please people, to make people happy. Okay, I have achieved this. Look at me now. I've gotten this. I am this because of what I carry. You are what you are as a child of God, it should be based on who you believe in, Jesus Christ. The life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Paul says, I can do all things. I can do all things. I can live in any circumstances comfortably by the strength I receive from Jesus. So you see, in all of this, I am living my life trusting his promise. Hallelujah. The song we sang this morning says, have faith in God. If I'm to have faith in God, God must have said something that I am trusting. Can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. It is the faith that I have and live by. That is what runs my everyday life. We have a lot of things that come to challenge us. A lot of things that try to make you feel that it is how much you put in. The Bible says, it is the blessing of the Lord that make it rich. Hard work can make you no richer. In other words, I can have physical things and overnight those things are gone. But my things and my life is secured if I am founded on the word of God. The promise of God is in his word. Hallelujah. And so the word of Jesus Christ that is given to us gives us the strength to live on the on a daily basis, knowing that all things will be well. Even when things are in a bad shape, things are not working the way everybody thinks it will work, but I am confident in what he has said. And because he said so, I am sure that everything will be all right. Hallelujah. He told Jairus when he invited him to come and pray or heal his daughter that was dying. And on their way going, there was a delay, and someone came and reported that the daughter is already dead. Jairus was confident and believing God, believing in Jesus, that the daughter would be okay. In fact, when I probably may think that he called the wife on phone and said, oh, I've met with Jesus and we are coming. So the matter is settled. Jesus is coming to our house and our daughter is going to be okay. And the family said, oh, thank God, Jesus is on his way coming. Ah, before he will come, everything will be okay. On their way coming, the child died. I know everybody lost faith. Everybody lost their confidence. That faith died because they feel that God cannot do anything beyond that point. And so Lazarus was downcasted. But what did Jesus say to him? Jesus said, keep on believing. Keep on believing. It does not look like anything can be done again. After all, the child is dead. The only good thing you can do for a dead person is to bury him or her. That also, but Jesus said, your child is not dead. Your child is sleeping. I am going to wake him up right now. Hallelujah. It looks very funny. And the people laughed at him. But Jesus was particular about that confidence. Because when you keep on believing, it means that even though it seems that my child is dead, my child is alive. He is not dead or she is not dead. She is what? Sleeping and will be woken up as soon as Jesus arrives. So that confidence is what makes you have hope, makes you sure, give you conf not just assurance, but confident assurance. How many of us are living our daily life with confident assurance that no matter what the economy may be, no matter what the circumstances may be, no matter how I probably may feel, you may say, oh, you have made a mistake. Whatever a man sow, that shall he also reap. You have sown some seed as it were. You have made certain things or acted in certain ways. 
that is now detrimental to your life, as it were. And people have told you, even the scriptures, maybe whatever a man sowed, shall you know, reap, you have sowed something and you will reap it. And the Lord is telling you, whatever my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. Hallelujah. And that word comes into your spirit. Whatever my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. That thing I did or that seed I sowed that was not right, that certainly I'm supposed to reap something bad because I sowed something bad as it were. I have repented of it, but yet I have already engaged that gear. And the vehicle is running according to my engagement. What do I do? I have to reap what I sow, but it is also written. What my father has not planted must be uprooted. Therefore, I planted it. It was not my father that planted it. It was not God that planted it. So now that I have faith in God, based on his word, that whatever in my life that he has not planted will be uprooted. I can now trust God. that though I am the one who sowed that wrong seed and by right to harvest the wrong harvest, his word says he will rescue me because he was not the one who planted it. And so he can uproot it. Hallelujah. So in that case, it can come to pass that even though I have sown something wrong, but because of my confidence in Jesus, I will not reap what I have sown. I will reap something different. Hallelujah. God will give me another opportunity to plant a better thing. That is why when people are living before they got saved, you are under one curse, family curse, and ancestral curse, and all these things are following you. Your grandfather have done something, and the thing is, you know, moving around. I watched something some time ago, and I discovered something that, you know, certain things work. Certain unseen forces work to create negative atmosphere in your life, and they begin to produce something that is bad. Now, these things are happening and succeeding when you are not in Christ. But when anyone is in Christ, he becomes a new creature. God brings you out of that family line and puts you into his own family. And automatically, all those curses have been broken without any other special prayer or breaking ancestral curses or breaking any you know, curse, whatever. Because you have been rescued from the dominion of darkness into the dominion of light. So Jesus has made that promise that whoever believes in me will be rescued from death unto life. And now I have believed in him. I can trust him that I have been rescued. Yes, I am supposed to be frustrated. I am supposed to pay for this wrong. I am supposed to suffer for this. But because of Jesus, because of my faith in him and his promise that he has rescued me, he will also do what? Rescue me. Hallelujah. So I can look unto him and see things change. Oh, they say, oh, you, are, you have failed an exam. You didn't write well. Ah, you didn't write well. But if God has given you a word and you tried your best, and even in that your best, it is like you're supposed to fail, you'll be surprised how everything will turn around. Are you trying to make people lazy? No. But what happens when I can trust in God? He says, when I am afraid, I put my trust in him. But he can put his trust in him because of his word. Now, for Abraham in the book of Romans, chapter 4, verse 18 to 20, the Bible says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so he became the father of many nations, just as it has been said to him, just as it has God told him, I have made you. He was in that state of childlessness and barrenness as it were, but God says, I have made you father of nations. Why is God making you what he wants to make you? Because he has a plan for your life. He wants to use you to accomplish the purpose for which he created you. You have derailed. The Bible says, all men have gone astray and everyone has gone to his own way. But the Lord has placed on Christ the iniquity of us all. You have gone astray like sheep, but he is bringing you back to the fold because he created you and he has in mind what he wants to do in your life. Hallelujah. And so he will do everything to bring you back to the fold. But that has to do with you agreeing with his word. You are born again, praise the Lord, but you agree that he can preserve your life. You agree 
that even against all hope, there is hope, even in hopelessness. Hallelujah. Against all hope, Abraham believed. What did he believe? He believed what was told him. Against all hope, the doctor has said there's no hope. The, the, the educational board has said there's no hope. Everybody has said there's no hope. All hope is gone. Go and prepare for your death. Hallelujah. But he had a word from God. And that word from God said to him, I have made you a father. And whether the circumstances like it or not, you will be that father. What you should be doing is to hold on to what God has said. That is what you mean by living faith. Living faith is living by the faith of the Son of God. So shall your offspring be. So without, he didn't allow the physical hopeless situation to make him hopeless. Instead, he was strong in faith, giving glory to God. He was strengthening his faith in faith. Yes, his wife's womb was dead. His own body was as good as dead. Yet, he was strengthened in faith. He was confidently assured that God will fulfill what he has said. That is why in the book of the Hebrew, verse 11, verse, the Hebrew chapter 11, verse 11, writing about Sarah, the Bible says, By faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, Hallelujah. What enabled, he was what? Enabled, she was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who made the promise. Abraham and Sarah at a point, Sarah wasn't agreeing initially, but later Sarah agreed. So both of them had confidence that God who had made the promise is able to fulfill his promise. Sometimes, Somebody can make you a promise and you don't believe he can fulfill it. There are people who, who have disappointed me a lot of times. So when they tell me, oh, I'm going to do this, I don't trust what they say. I just say, okay, I hear you. I just relax. If they do it, okay, they don't do it, I don't mind. Because I don't have confidence in them. They have made me lose trust in them because they don't keep to their words. All right? Now, that is not how God is. I'm going to show you how... Uh, why sometimes you think that God has made his, a promise and he did not keep to his word as it were. You know that he didn't really make that promise. It was you who fabricated the promise and that is why it didn't happen. But if he has made a promise and you are sure he has made that promise, then you can be sure that it will happen. When God told Abraham this, it took 25 years for it to become a reality. That same promise God made to Abraham was also on Isaac. Isaac was to be uh, the, the, the person that would produce all those children that Sarah and Abraham had to have. So what happened? Isaac married his wife, and 20 years of marriage, there was no child coming. And Isaac prayed unto God. What was he praying? He was reminding God his promise. God, you promised us that my father will give back to me, and through me, you will create many nations that will be children of my father. Now, if I don't have any children, then that your word is not coming to pass. And the Bible says, and God visited Rebekah. And the word of God at the appointed time came to pass, and Rebekah conceived of twins. And then she learned also how to consult with God, just like the father. So when you, God has given you his promise, you can always pray. And so when you are praying, you are praying in faith. What is praying in faith? I am praying based on the promise that God has given to me. I am not just praying for fancy. So the prayer of faith is powerful and effective. What is the prayer of faith? The prayer of faith is the prayer you pray based on what God has said. You are standing on God's word and praying or declaring something. Hallelujah. And when you do so, you can be sure that God who is faithful will not fail in fulfilling his promise. Hallelujah. Now, what promise has God made? What promise do you have? Sometimes we just live our life just like that. We don't even calculate anything. We just live and hope in uh, God is alive. God day. God day. God day. You, are, you say you are having faith in God, but actually you are having faith in someone else. You are trusting your uncle, your father, your brother, your sister, your auntie, your niece, and then you are saying that you are having faith in God. Your faith is necessarily not in God. Because if that person says, I am not going to take care of these things anymore, you, are, you, you begin to cry. You say, I'm done for. I'm finished. 
Somebody promised me before I got into university that going to take care of my you know, fees. And I said, okay. And the person fulfilled the first part of the promise. Then along the line, the person said, I am not going to take care again. I am not going to fulfill anything again. I am done. Then I should have said, hey, I'm finished. But my confidence was not in that person. My confidence was in the way that God told me even before I got that admission. All right? So I was so confident that God who began this good work, he will fulfill it. I am not trusting that person. And so when the person said, I am not going to sponsor you anymore, I received a word in my spirit that says, I am going to give you direct sponsor. That person, I was giving the person what belongs to you so the person can enjoy some and give you your own. But now I am going to make it direct. I'm going to give you everything direct. So my, my stay in school was after the person withdrew was better than when the person was actually sponsoring. You see, because I was now receiving direct sponsor. God fulfilled his word. I said, well, you will not fail until you graduate. That was God's word for me. And I went to school. I studied like every other person. People study and still fail. I actually was, I received many results, about two or three results that said fail. Or your result is missing. Or that and that, which would have made me to repeat. But I went back to God and I prayed the prayer of faith. What was the prayer of faith? God, you said I will not fail until I graduate. What is happening now? And the Lord spoke to me, you have not failed. Do this and do that. Hallelujah. And when I did what he asked me to do, everything was rectified. I didn't have to rewrite any exam. And I got exactly what I wanted at the end of my program. What am I trying to say? When you have the word of God and you are living by faith, living by faith, therefore, is living by the confident assurance given to you by God. And praying in faith is praying based on the confident assurance that God has given to you. So what confident assurance have God given to you concerning your marriage? What confident assurance? Now you hear every day with divorces everywhere now. People are, marriage is breaking, both among Christians and unbelievers. It's now rampart with this marriage must work. This marriage must work. You are all, we are not even married. You are thinking of working. Already you have diverted. You have shifted. Just like the book of Hebrews says, he said the judge shall live by faith, but when he drifts back, my soul shall not have pleasure in him. God will not be pleased with you because you are not walking in faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. What does it mean? Without walking by and trusting on, the God, on God's word, God cannot be pleased. And how do we know that God is not pleased? He cannot fulfill his, the word. He is not fulfilling that word, not because he does not want to fulfill it, not because he has not already programmed it, but because you have rejected it. He says, uh, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You see? He said, but you, because you have rejected knowledge, you have rejected. Lack of knowledge is because there's no knowledge. It's not because there's no knowledge. It's because you are rejecting the knowledge. So this is not about religious affairs. It's not about sowing a special seed so that God will make it happen. Or crying or declaring 40 days prayer on fasting. Or trying to pressure God. No, 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 no. It is knowing what he has said and relying on it, and continuously, do what? Continuously communicate with God in line with what he has said, so that we'll be updated and know that, oh, all things are possible to him that believeth. So what has God said concerning your family? What has God said concerning your children? What has God said concerning your health? What has God said concerning your business? I was running a business sometime, and it was God who gave me the idea for that business. And I started the business, but after a while, the business stopped working. Nobody was buying anymore. I have already ordered the goods I want to sell, but nobody was buying it anymore. And I was disturbed. What did I do? I prayed the prayer of faith. What was my prayer of faith? I went back to God and said, Lord, you said, you asked me to start this business. Now people are not buying. What is going on. I am coming to remind you of this business deal that both of us have. Hallelujah. Immediately he told me what to do. Take that goose and go to the, customer, uh, the, the, to the customers and ask them to buy. And when I did that, they bought every goose that I have and even placed order for more. Hallelujah. What does that mean? When God has given you his word and you feel that it's not happening, 
you go back to God in prayer to know what is going on, to check on it. Hallelujah. Uh, uh, Habakkuk says, I will place my eyes on the watch. I will look at what he has told me. He said, write down the vision. It will speak. Even though it tarries, it will not tarry. It will come to pass. So what has God said? You must be sure of what God has said concerning your children, what God has said concerning your life. With that, you will not be afraid. Against all hope, you will still have hope. You will be strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Hallelujah. When fear seems to come, you refuse that fear because you have confidence in the one whom you have interacted with. He gives his promise by his word, revealed to us by his Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 and 12. He says, now we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us. Everything God promises us or gives to us is not because of what we pay him. It's because of who we are in him and because of who he is to us. He is our father and it is his responsibility to take care of us. But we must cooperate with him. Hallelujah. If, you don't, if my father wants to train me in school, but I refuse to go to school, I will not be educated. Not because my father is not able to take care of my education, but because I have personally rejected and refused to follow that way. There are those their father pays their school fees. Instead of going to school, they go and join court. And in the, in the process, they are killed. That is not the will of the father, but that is their stupidity. Let us not be stupid in our Christianity. When I say Christianity, I mean in our union with Christ. The Bible says that we should not act as the unwise, but we should act as the wise. You know, maximizing and taking advantage of the opportunity God gives to us because the days are evil. Why are the days evil? The devil is working 24 hours to make you to doubt God's word by making you feel that it is delaying and God may not fulfill what he has said again. But if you know what he has said, nothing will stop you. You will keep moving forward. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So what has God said? He said, we have not received the, the, the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, so that we can what? Receive all that God has freely given to us. He said, these things are revealed to us by his spirit. You have the spirit of God in you, and so he reveals things to you. How does he reveal it to us? We're going to end by listing three major ways. There can be other ways anyway. Three major ways he can reveal his will, his plan for you. Hallelujah. Number one way he reveals it is through the scripture. The Holy Spirit reveals things to us through the scripture. Don't forget the Bible says that scriptures are given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for correction, for rebuke, for instruction, and for edification, so that the man of God will be fully equipped for every good work. Hallelujah. And so the scripture is given to us to give us hope, to show us what God has for us. So sometimes God reveals his plan for us through the scriptures. The Bible tells us in Romans 15 verse 4, it says, for whatsoever things we are written at four times, Whatsoever things we are written are four times, for our, we are written for our learning. What is learning? Learning is to adjust your life in line with what you are taught. What have been written have been written for our learning so that through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. So the comfort, the, when I'm patient, I'm patient because of what the scriptures have said. I am sure that I am saved because of what God has said through the scriptures. The scripture is purely the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I am sure of one thing or the other because God reveals that to me through the scriptures. And I must hold on to that thing that he has revealed to me through the scriptures for life. Now, most times God may have said something to someone, but God is bringing that thing back to you. For example, if I, I, I one time read the book of Deuteronomy, I think it was the ch last chapter, and I saw that Moses lived for 120 years. His natural strength was not abated, and his eyes never grew dim. And as I meditated on that scripture, it was about Moses. 
but I had confidence in my spirit that I will live long, hallelujah, and that my eyes will not grow dim. I will not put eyeglass to be able to read, even in my old age, hallelujah. Now, I am confident in that. What if I have something happening in my eyes and look like I am not seeing clearly? Should I now change? Bible say, against all hope, Abraham believed in hope. So against all hope, I can hold on to that inspiration I received from the scripture. I received another one from Psalm 91, in Psalm 91 that says, with long life will I satisfy you and show you my salvation. In fact, that word came when I was actually praying for my father and when he was initially sick that first time. And so I, I went to him and said, this is what God placed in my heart while I was praying for you. He says, with long life will I satisfy you and show you my salvation. In other words, I will keep delivering you. If you can hold on to this word, you will live as long as you want to live. He says, I may make and they do below don't do make up for doogie, meaning that I will feed you with long life until you are done. The time you say you are done, it will be done. When you say, I'm okay, I don't want to live any further, then he will stop. He says, You with long life will I what? Satisfy you and show you my salvation. So the Holy Spirit reveals God's will to us through the scripture. It can be contextually, it can be out of context. Now, when it is out of context, it is for me personally. I don't share those with you. It is not for you. It is for me. When it is in context, it is for you. You see? So it is for you when it is in context. It is for only me when it is out of context. What do I mean by out of context? It simply means that sometimes a word can be used to speak to me, but if you read it in context, it does not really mean that thing. I'll give you an example. You know, uh, uh, I was reading an, a, a scripture and I saw it say, You have passed from death unto life. And what came to my spirit was, You have passed already from death unto life. Contextually, talking about our salvation in Christ. But in that state, I was preparing for an exam and he said, You have passed already. So that you have passed already became prominent in my spirit. And so I wrote it down, I have passed already. It is not in context with what is written down. But for me, God has used that word to tell me that I have passed already. There are other examples. But because of time, I will not go into that. But all I'm saying is that God can speak to you as you read the scripture. As you read the scripture, open your heart. Whatever may be your need, as you read, God can pick one word and highlight it to you. And that is what he's telling you. Hallelujah. So that is one way the Spirit of God can reveal the mind of God or express God's promise to you on a personal basis. We have general promises in the scripture, but there are promises that are specific and these promises can be for you. Like when God told Abraham, I have made you father of all nations, the nations. That was to Abraham specifically. But you can be praying and God can put it in your spirit. I have made you using the same word and put it in your mind, and God can use it to speak to you. That is scripture. Number two way he can reveal his will and his promise to you is through prophetic insight. What do I mean by prophetic insight? It is by putting some rhema in you. Now, he can do it through the scripture as well. Sometimes it may not be actually from the scripture. He plants word in your heart, which is able to save you. In James chapter 1, verse 21, he said, Therefore, get rid of all moral faith and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in your heart, which can what? Save you. The word save means sozo, which inclines help, save, heal, deliver. So there is a word he plants in your heart in that area. Now, sometimes, you, I, I, there was a time I, I had a, a situation and that was a problem for me and about three or four people and every one of us were really downcasted and worried about that problem. While I was praying about that, I received a word planted in my heart. It was not from the scripture. It was actually a statement of one military general he, that he made you know, when he was writing his book. He said, because I was involved and that word came to my heart. Because you are involved, I am going to save all the other four people from this problem. 
you are in this problem because of them. If you just them, they will not come out of it. But because you are involved, I will save them. So I wrote it down and I told them, God says, because I am involved in this matter, all of you are going to be free from it. It was a very difficult situation that if I tell you the story, you know that it, naturally it can never be solved. There's only one way, and that way is not the best way for us. But because I was involved, according to that word planted in my heart, we were freed from that problem, and we got what we needed. Hallelujah. So this can come to you while you are praying. God can plant a word in your spirit while you are praying. He can plant a word in your spirit while you are listening to a sermon. He can plant it in your spirit just by seeing a sticker pasted on a, a, a door or a car. I was driving, rushing to go and meet someone who was very sick, and I was very much disturbed. The person had already concluded that he was going to die. So I was rushing to go and talk to the person and, you know, if I can pray with the person, but I was still scared. And then a car overtook me. That car overtook me. I was angry that the car overtook me, but suddenly my spirit told me, look at the sticker at the back of that car. And when I looked at it, what I saw was what? There shall be no loss. Hallelujah. And it is normal, there shall be no loss. So was it? But it became strong in my spirit. There shall be no loss. There shall be no loss. It means that that person you are going to see will not die. And so I go to the person and say, you are not dying. So forget about that. Because the Lord has spoken concerning you, says, there shall be no loss. Because if you die, it's a loss to me. Hallelujah. So that word came to me from a sticker. A sticker you paste in your house is not to weigh away demons and to pursue another term. It is something you read. God can speak to you through a calendar. God can even speak to you while you are watching a movie. Yes. There is a prophetic insight can come to your spirit while you are watching a movie. It may not even be a religious movie as it were. It can come to you while you are listening to news. It can come to you while you are listening to a, watching a documentary. So you have to open up your heart and be ready to receive. You can also receive prophetic insight when you are discussing with someone. While you are discussing with someone, the insight just comes into your spirit. Pick up your pen and write it down. So at any time, Put your eyes on the watch. Like Habakkuk says, I will put my eyes on the watch and see what he will say to me. So there will always be prophetic insight. It's not necessarily a prophet coming to come and prophesy to you. God is going to, by his spirit, prophesy to you. Put a prophetic insight in your spirit. Suddenly your eyes open and you see a truth that you cannot despise. It can come through song. I was in a hotel room, I didn't have money to pay, and my time to, to move have reached. I was confused, I was praying, oh God, how do I leave this place, how do I pay? And the word came to me like a song. Jesus, I our Jesus is alive, don't be scared, whatever happens, look unto him. When I started singing that song in my spirit, it just gave me confidence that no matter what happens, I am going to pay this bill comfortably. I don't know how. So I just kept meditating on that song that has been planted in my heart. Not up to 20 minutes, I had a knock at the door and somebody came to see me. And the person said, the bills have been taken care of. I never knew that even while I was worried, everything has already been taken care of. You see how God gave me that prophetic insight through a song. Hallelujah. So it can come through any other channel that God may seem to, maybe God can use somebody with the gift of, a, of prophecy to prophesy to you. And when he prophesy, your spirit will align with what he's saying. If your spirit is not aligned and what he's prophesying is contrary to the scriptures, then you can stand against it. Now, when God sent a prophet or somebody with a prophetic gift to give you a prophetic word, that person speaks not a new thing. It is simply confirming what God has been putting in your spirit that you are not too sure. So that person's word will only confirm it. God has told to you, all things will work together for your good. And you are wondering. And as you are going out in the morning, you see a friend. Say, how are you? Say, good morning. He say, oh, my brother, all things will work together for your good. You are receiving a prophetic insight. You see, he that began the good work in you, he will perfect it. He will complete it. God began this thing with you. He will complete it. I, I, I was already told that I'm not going to fail in school, but I was so scared of failing that I, I, I became a mobile library. 
I always carry my book anywhere I'm going. So one day in the evening, other students were going out for you know, recreation and that thing. I was carrying my book. A, a, man, a young man met me and said, ah, where are you going? So I'm going to go and read. He said, going to read since morning. Eh? Go and keep that book and go and walk around at least see the campus. Don't be tying yourself up. And he said, look, God helped you to pass through primary school. He helped you to pass through secondary school. He brought you into this school, to, into this high institution right now. You think he will not help you to pass through it? Relax. When he said that word, the thing entered into my spirit like a prophetic insight. Relax. My fear has left me because I was reading based on fear. My fear left me. I packed all those books and went back to my room and dumped them and called a friend of mine. Let's walk around the campus and see how things are going. And I never killed myself like that anymore. That was a prophetic insight but from a, a friend, a classmate who was just passing by and he made that statement. So be ready for God to speak to you. You might be just receive a prophetic insight by watching some foul animals play on the street. A lot of things, God is ready to speak to you, but are you ready to listen? Because it is what you hear that determines the faith that you will have. And the last way God can may speak to you, the Spirit of God can reveal God's plan for you, is through vision. Now, vision is a revelation that comes maybe sometimes while you are sleeping at night, or you know, while you are sitting down and you doze off, your, 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 your consciousness is off, and you are in a, in a subconscious state, and you see a pictorial presentation or a voice speaking to you, telling you about something. Abraham had that experience when he was asking God, how am I sure that my descendants will possess this land? And God made him to be in a state of sleeping, and then he brought a pictorial thing to him and told him, this is how it's going to happen. Your children will go into the land of bondage, they will be there for 400 years, after which they will return back to this land, and they will see by the word of God, God has told Abraham, before Abraham died, he knew his children would be in Egypt, and then after 400 years, they will come back to the land of promise. So God confirmed his word and gave him assurance. So it can come through vision. The Bible tells us in Acts 18, 9 to 11, say one night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Now this period, Paul was being persecuted and he was so scared, they were about to kill him. And he didn't know whether he was to stay or to run away. And that night, the Lord spoke to him in a vision. He said, do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one is going to attack you and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul had confidence in God to stay in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. Paul would have run away. Paul would have left, but God gave him a vision to encourage him. The word he received gave him the confidence to stay on in the city of Corinth and continue preaching. God said, I have people for you in this land, so do not go anywhere. Hallelujah. The same thing happened to Paul again when they were in a boat, and the boat was about to capsize. They were all scared. And then the word of the Lord came to him in a vision. An angel of the Lord came and said to him, I have given you the life of everyone in this ship. Nobody will lose his life. There shall be no loss. He said, the ship will break. The ship will scatter, but nobody will die. And that gave Paul confidence. His stomach packed up. He couldn't eat before this time, but when he received this confidence, he could now eat and encouraged others with the word. So when I preach, I am preaching to you with the encouragement that God has given to me. I'm telling you this morning, you can live by faith. And by faith means by the word of God. And I've shown you the three ways God can reveal his word to you. What is God telling you? Isaac was, you know, in a situation where everybody was japaring, you know, japa. Everybody was traveling to places where things are going well, to Canada, to Europe, to uh, the US, you know, there are things are going on well. Isaac, like every other person, packaged himself packed up his back. He was about to move, but God gave him a vision and said, do not go to Egypt. Sow your seed in this barren land as it were, and uh, remain in this land. And so as, uh, he woke up, and then he, he lived by faith. Hallelujah. What is he living by faith? He lived by acting on what God told him. He sowed in that same land where people say things are difficult, and he harvested a hundredfold what is God revealing to you? 
I, I, Daniel and his brothers were about to be killed with other people, and they were worried. In their prayer, God gave him a vision at night and showed him the mystery that would bring him out of that trouble. So when you find yourself in a session, pray with faith. The first faith you have is given to you from the scripture. They call upon me in times of trouble, and I will deliver you. So you go to pray. So God, you said, call upon me in time of trouble, and I will deliver you. Now I am calling upon you. This is my trouble. Deliver me. And that he, he would respond to you by giving you a word from the scripture, or by giving you a vision, or by giving you a prophetic insight by any channel he chooses, and then you'll be able to be sure that it has been done. Then you say, thank you, Lord. It is done in Jesus' name. You are getting up from that prayer, and then you are giving thanks to God. You go to church and you give thanksgiving. You celebrate. You call your brethren, God has done it. But what has God done? You say, he has done it. He has done it not because I am just saying it. He has given me his word. Most people are saying, eh, eh, God has done it. He carried my mother for help. Eh, see what the Lord has done. You are just saying all those things for saying sake. You have no concrete proof that God has done anything. Somebody met me and said, eh, you, have, you, you, you promised to give me something. You have not given me. me. When did I promise you? I never promised you anything. So I am not under any obligation to give you what I have not promised you. I didn't promise you. But if I have made that promise and you remind me, so, oh, sorry, I have made this promise and I will fulfill it. God is faithful, but he is faithful to his word. Make sure you have his word. Make sure you have his word. And you can stand on his word and pray. And when you feel that everything is crumbling and it's not working the way you want, what do you do? You go back to him and pray the prayer of faith. In other words, prayer based on the word he has given to you. Faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing the word of God. You have had the word of God either through the scripture or through a prophetic insight or through vision. Stand on that word. And God who has spoken will fulfill his word. I will end by saying the word of God is for you. Don't depend on any other kind of faith. Don't depend on any other kind of faith. Hold on to the word, the faith that God has given to you. Paul says, I live by the faith given to me by the Son of God. Don't depend on any other kind of faith because they may fail you. You must get the word from the Lord, understand it very well, and then stand by it. Because some people will come and tell you, my brother, leave that thing. You are just wasting your time. Oh. Opportunity is passing you by you. Oh. But you know what you are doing because you are standing on the rock that never fails. He said, the man who builds his word, his house on the rock, is like a man who hears his word and what and holds onto it. The storm may come. The rage, everything may come to shake it. But people may even say, ah, your own is finished. Look at him. Oh, sorry. They may pity you. They may laugh at you behind their backs. They may say all sorts of things. But at the end, at the end, you are the one to celebrate because God's word is faithful. Depend on God alone. First Corinthians 2 5 says, Your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That power of God is the word of God. Your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. First Corinthians 2 verse 5. So where is my faith standing? On the wisdom of men or the power of God? What is the power of God? The word of God. Hallelujah. So uh, the word of God is called the word of faith because it brings confidence and along with it, it takes up everything to make sure that your expectation comes to pass. It also provides a shield that protects you from any assault from the wicked one designed to move you from your place of security. I am secured. No fear about the future, for I'm standing on the word that never fails. Standing on the word that never fails. Jesus is the word, the rock of ages. I am secured. No fear about the future, for I'm standing on the word that never fails. Are you standing on the word that never fails? Now, the just shall live by faith. But if he draws back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we do not 
belong to those who draw back and are destroyed, but among those who have faith and are saved. I believe God has spoken to you this morning through this edifying word. I believe that just as he has encouraged me through this word, he has also encouraged you through this word. Listen to it again and listen to it again and share it with others who you believe or don't believe they are passing through one challenge or the other. If they are not born again, the primary faith you need, you need is the saving faith. Call upon me and I will save you. The first trouble you have is eternal damnation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And continue to believe in him and he will preserve you through your stay in this life until the day of the end. To the glory of his name, in Jesus' name, amen. If you are not born again, do that right now and ask the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your life. Tell him that you are ready and that open. You believe that in him you have eternal life. And if you are saved and you are passing through challenges, we have given you the solution this morning. Seek the face of the Lord through the scripture. Open your heart to prophetic insight and get ready to receive the vision. Whichever way, God will speak to you. And the word he has said, you can stand on that and nothing can move you. Be immovable. Give yourself fully to this word. And the God of heaven, who confirms his word, who is faithful, will perfect his word in your life. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for everyone who have listened. And I thank you for those who will be listening after. I ask that the spirit of the living God will unveil the truth of the word to their hearts and bring about salvation, healing, deliverance, and refreshment. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right. I believe you have been blessed by the teaching of this morning through the World Congress. And I trust that you will also share it with your brothers and friends and uh, let them also be blessed by it. If you have your offering, you can always give. And the Lord bless you as you do that in Jesus' name. Father, accept our offering. We give to the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right. If you want to give an offering, the procedure of doing that is already on the platform where you are watching. And if you want to confirm, you can call the same number you see there or WhatsApp and we'll be able to give you direction on what to do. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord set his countenance on you and may you continue to enjoy his shalom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you and see you again on Sunday for another part of World Congress. Bye-bye.